We're back in the Oxford landscape to take a look at the sarcophagus we identified during our last dig. And we've got two important questions to answer. Can we identify the bones that the farmer placed back in that sarcophagus? And can we find any undisturbed Roman soil? And this is also a fantastic opportunity for Naomi to sample the soil both around the coffin and underneath. And we're also hoping to be able to take a look at Roman funerary practices. What kind of grave goods did they put in the grave and what kind of ceremonies went on at the funeral? And this time we've got less than three days to do it. Our site is situated on the Broughton Estate in Oxfordshire, where Time Team visited last year to investigate the huge Roman villa in the neighbouring field. But with efforts of that dig focused on the main site, we left some unfinished business at the end of day three, so we've returned with a small team of specialists, our expedition crew, to further investigate the very sarcophagus that brought us here in the first place. You can see the relationship between the Roman villa in the field behind me and the sarcophagus buried in this field here. And we've got metal detectorists trying to identify the location of that burial as we speak. While ploughing this field in 1963, a farmer struck the edge of a buried Roman sarcophagus. Archaeologists were called in to investigate and they removed the bones for analysis. The remains were later reinterred back within the sarcophagus and the field was returned to agriculture. The exact location of the burial was lost until 2016 when it was rediscovered by Time Team's resident metal detectorist Keith Westcott, who then realised there must be a Roman villa somewhere nearby. What a difference a few months makes. This is it's incredible. It's amazing, isn't it? It's, you can't see anything because the barley is just so high. I mean, how we're going to find it in this crop, I'm not <laughs> sure. I think we're, we've got to put a lot of faith into our technology here. <laughs> Keith, we're back where it all began. Presumably you identified this first and then that led us to the amazing villa over here. And we've come back full circle and we're investigating this. Yes, well, it was always an odd spot for a sarcophagus to be mm. on its own. So that allowed me to think further. Standing here in this landscape with a crop like this, it gives a real sense of what it could have looked like sweeping wheat and barley fields in the Roman time. Yes, it uh, wouldn't have looked too much different as far as this area is concerned. Mm. So the people, the occupants over in the villa could have been gazing out into this landscape over here at one of their relatives buried in the sarcophagus. Well, I think she was so important to them and uh, yeah, this is the perfect position for her to be. What a way to honour your family. Keith has relocated the sarcophagus with his metal detector. Adam and Pete have marked up the location of the trench and we're ready to go. Oh. How you doing, Pete? This is hard work, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It's certainly keeping me, uh, keeping me healthy. Yeah, you're weather. doing a cracking job. So last year, it was about a year ago we were here last and we, we came down basically to the level of the sarcophagus. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do now, we've decided to put this slot across it, find the level that we got to and then uh, start to make a plan of action really yeah 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 absolutely like yeah so if we look at the picture from last year Pete, we can see the layout of the uh, sarcophagus really nicely here so we, yeah. we've sort of put our sondage in across the middle of it here um, and we've got some of the remaining bits of we think this is the lid mm. um, and these are a few of the bits so we don't know whether these markings are natural linked to the sort mm. of eulitic mm. limestone or whether they're perhaps man-made so yeah. it'd be interesting to get to the bottom of that and if there's any uh, more bits of the, the sarcophagus itself that might mm. be decorated but you can see it was particularly shallow we, i mean we shouldn't yeah. be shouldn't be going through this too too much longer well, yeah we really shouldn't be coming down too much further and, and actually we're hitting some very very solid soil here so perhaps we're almost, almost reaching there. that level okay. yeah we better yeah. crack on i suppose yeah while Lawrence and Pete continue to open up the trench, Helen caught up with Dr John Pierce to find out a little bit more about Roman funerary practices. John, we're assuming that the woman who's buried in our grave over there, in life, lived in the enormous villa mm. in the field to the north. So when she dies, given that she's living in such an amazing kind of palatial mm. establishment, what, what are the preparations that you have to do for, for that kind of funeral? Mm. Well, a lot of it is about party planning. So we imagine that these late Roman funerals 
for someone like this in particular, they're big affairs. So the extended family would be invited. We imagine, you know, she's a member of a major landing, landowning family around here. So invite the peer group from round about. We might imagine her male relatives are, you know, the members of urban councils and so on. So probably other people from public life. So would coming be coming, from, coming from the nearest town. Coming from the nearest town yeah. potentially, and then we would have, you know, the household itself, tenants, workers slaves, a big, a big group of people, you know, possibly running into three figures. Oh, here we go, there we go, Adam, look at that. Oh, brilliant, that's fantastic. It's got two edges there. I wonder, we've got to be getting quite close to the, uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, there we go. This end of the trench of Kenzer. Yeah, yeah, that's what we want to see, so we know the depth we want to get to now. So not too much more to come off, isn't it? Really. Yeah. I know this has been encountered before, but it's still really rare to be able to, to excavate even a partly disturbed burial in the modern era with all the things that we can do that couldn't have been done 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, I think most of the ones I've seen are in gardens, stately home, museum collections from yeah, a century yeah. ago. Yeah, I think most of them are antiquarian. Mm. There's hardly any been found since the great explosion of archaeology since 1990. Mm. And, and what the ones that have been found, of course, the scientific work that you can do on them is absolutely extraordinary to be able to recover such tiny traces of, of grave goods and, and things placed around. It's tough going on one of the hottest days of the year, but by mid-morning we've already got further than we did last summer. What would have happened as she was brought from the villa up to her burial place. I think we would imagine the procession, probably the body is being brought on a beer or something similar from the villa itself, people behind her and amongst that procession we would anticipate there being professional mourners, so wailing, tearing their hair and so on, music being played. We would imagine that there's going to be a speech of some kind, we would imagine the kind of the, the virtue of the deceased would be, uh, would be praised in whatever was, in whatever was said. They'll be eating and drinking, going on, so the smells will be sort of barbecue type smells. There'll be the deposition in the, in the tomb with the grave goods placed with her. Now that we've defined the extent of the burial, we can bring in John and the JCB and have a look at the area around the sarcophagus. We're hoping this might reveal materials associated with the funeral or even help find the original cut of the grave. We've now found our level then, but we have got an immense amount to do. We need to really think about what we're going to do when we come down in these areas. It's all very well looking at this lovely photogrammetry, but we really need to be able to colour things in, don't we? So why don't you draw it out? Yeah. So let's get our sarcophagus in here. And if we put in a notional cut around it. That we might or might not end up being able to see. And then broadly speaking, a trench edge, a pretty yep. slapdash line. <laughs> <laughs> it's looking beautiful, buddy. And then I know that you muted the idea of putting in a quadrant, which mm. I think makes an awful lot of sense. Um, so we have a section here and a section here, and we'd seek to remove the backfill around the sarcophagus and two opposing sections to give us a cross section through the whole thing. Mm. And then we can take some blocks, some columns uh, yeah. along those, can't we? And presumably, Naomi, morphology. could, could that give us enough access to put in a small sondage underneath and take some samples? I'd like to hopefully think so, because obviously all the soil that we are sort of having a, a, a sieve and, you know, that we're going through with the metal detector, this is all soil that's been mucked about. To get a good, decent soil sample, as soon as we start to see something that looks like it could be an original uh, a Roman surface, mm -hmm. That's, that's where it gets a bit more exciting for me, I think. Now that, that works really well for the quadrants in the backfill, but of course we've got to pay attention to what's inside the sarcophagus as well. So we can just very carefully work our way down and try and define the 1960s deposits, mm -hmm. yeah. as we would archaeology, as yeah. we would. And it's the finds that we're going for there. Mm. The, not just the, the bones, but the any tiny little grave goods, tiny little bits of yeah. smashed glass or whatever, mm. that, that they might have not noticed at so the time. So we should sieve that, even though it is Absolutely. 60s backfield, yeah. we should sieve that yeah. very carefully, yeah. shouldn't we? We need to get all of her out as yes. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> With the sun beating down, we've found some tents to protect ourselves and the archaeology, and our strategy is beginning to pay off. Okay, so we seem to be getting the uh, lead lining mm. on the inside. It's coming round here. How about your end? Yeah, we've the same. We've got a lovely bit coming up. It's peeling away, sort of laminating away from the side of the sarcophagus here. But um, 
It's a beautiful thing. I mean, do we know much about the, the purpose oh, of it? Oh, I think we're starting to uh, get some human remains, maybe. Yep. Is that definitely. Yeah, that's the first first phalanx. Very big. That's right where the remains were when yes. we came down on it last time, mm. isn't it? In and around these stones. So I wonder if those stones are packing around where they reburied mm -hmm. the. Uh, Preservation's not bad, you know. It's not bad, is it's it? It's really not bad. So do you think that a coffin might have been ready waiting for her? And she'd be perhaps, you know, um, reverently placed within it it's, and then laid out. Yeah, it's a big question for these for these very substantial containers. Yes, you know, when you've got a, a stone coffin and then a lead liner within it as well, how is it possible with decorum to have someone pre-placed in it and then with all these people assembled and the speeches being given to lower them in the ground with any, you know. Yes, with loads with, of workmen all saying, a, over here a bit, mate. Yes. Yeah. So one might imagine therefore that some of this is done before, you know, the pit is excavated, the coffin is put in place, the liner is put in place, and then it's the deposition of the body, either shrouded or possibly even dressed into the, into the receptacle object placed with her. We have found those fragments of lead that looks like it was pressed, pressed between the lid and the sarcophagus itself. Mm. We've got this stone sarcophagus with a lead lining. And sarcophagus literally meaning flesh eater. Whereas <laughs> the lead would have preserved quite well the body. Mm, yeah. And these big stones in the middle, we're still thinking they're part of the lid. I think the lid, it looks like the lid was broken up and then used to backfill the sarcophagus when the bones were reinterred. Mm -hmm. And we've got an awful lot of lid fragments, so I wonder if we can piece some of them together. That would be good. We've been talking all afternoon about the kinds of grave goods that would be put in a grave like this. Things that wouldn't survive, like resins and perfumes, or even something like flowers. And the kinds of things that would survive, like glass vessels, pottery vessels, even coins. And Matt, our digital supremo, has been busy reconstructing the only grave good that we know of from this grave. What have you come up with, Matt? We've made a replica. Oh my goodness. Based on the remaining photographs of what came out, we've 3D modelled it and had it 3D printed. 3D printed? But it looks exactly like glass. I mean, it looks exactly like Roman glass. And it, it even, it's even got the weight mm -hmm. of glass. I'm used to 3D printing being in lines, you know, it looks very much like plastic. This looks phenomenal. What's it made of? It's done in a uh, opaque resin mm -hmm. to match the the record of the original find. And it feels really strange to handle something that was made as a digital model and brought back to sight. Yes, yes, because it would have been in our, our grave there. The other thing that's absolutely extraordinary about it is how small it is. Mm -hmm. And we now think that these are perfume bottles or unguent bottles, but I gather that uh, 100 or 200 years ago they were often known as tear bottles because um, it was thought that they might have um, collected the individual tears of the mourners. It wouldn't have taken uh, a lot to fill up. No, it's so small. But you could also imagine just dabbing it on, couldn't you? Dabbing it onto your wrist with this rim that would kind of rub it in. It's, it's, it's almost like a special perfume dabber. It's a shame we don't know what it smelled of. No, no, you can imagine holding it to your, your nose. It is such a beautiful little object, isn't it? When we first arrived this morning, I was concerned that we had too much on our hands, and particularly when we started excavating by hand in that sondage over the sarcophagus. But as soon as the digger arrived, it allowed us to open up a bigger space. Uh, we had it cleaned up by lunch and photographed, and the, the rate at which we've worked this afternoon has been, been fantastic. This has all gone very well. I'm looking forward to getting to the bottom of the sarcophagus. I'm looking forward to getting it all cleaned off and get some nice photography for it. I can already see the chisel marks starting to come out. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm really excited. I, I, I've got to say, though, I really do want to see inside as well. We had been a little worried that there was no official record of the bones being reinterred in the 1960s. But just before the end of the day, our fears are put to rest. I think Lawrence just found the end of a long bone. <gasps> but I could be wrong. This could be one of those I moments. I think he's wrong. I'm, I, I bet you're a pint you're wrong. No, that's, that's bone. That's definitely bone. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Naomi? Okay. I mean, 
colour wise, I mean, she'd never really go on colour, but it does look like bone. However, I would expect it to either be coming this way and not really going mm. down. To me, it's that sound. It doesn't have the yeah, stony ting. It's no, got a, a it gentle, soft fud when okay, you scrape it. Okay, it. It, 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 it is coming back this there way. It is. It is coming back Take this it way. Back. That stunned me. That has. So In that terms, of, it stunned me. The, the the preservation of that. Oh. It's it's amazing to say this has been dug out in the sixties. It was out. It's put back in. Uh, I mean, the the little pieces that we had earlier were you know fairly good but this i mean that's that's it that's how you would expect to see it you know if you were ex excavating it for the very first time as we leave the cornfield after our first day we're pleased to have rediscovered our roman lady but she's given us a lot to think about well cheers everyone to cheers. a successful um well first day so I think for me, a priority is getting that the material that's still inside the sarcophagus removed and, and yeah, understood. Yeah, totally. And for me, I really want to see if there's any remains of grave goods, you know, tiny little pieces of pottery or glass, mm -hmm. something that would be, have been overlooked. Yeah, that would be nice. And obviously we made that, that discovery just at the end of the day now. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, was, I was nervous. I was thinking, this is not going to happen then. Yeah. Right at the very last minute, there it was, gleaming. And when I say gleaming, I, I can't get over the, the, how well preserved it is. Yeah, it's, it's a really nice way to have ended the first day because mm. I, I think, honestly, we've made better progress than I thought we would. And we've even had some little blobs of charcoal around the edge, which yeah. I think could be indicative of activities that were happening at the time of so, the burial. I mean, a hell of a first day, but what a day we're going to have tomorrow. You have got blisters. I know. Blisters? <laughs> 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 One more day. One more day. Anyway, cheers, guys. Cheers. <laughs> So together we brought Time Team back and now we're going to take Time Team to the next level. Help us achieve 10,000 ongoing members on Patreon. Your ongoing membership enables us to develop more sites and more episodes. Join a thriving worldwide community of Time Team fans on Patreon. It's the beginning of day two, and rather nerve-wrackingly, that's also our final day. And although we got an immense amount done yesterday, there's still a huge amount to do, isn't there, Derek? That's right, we've only got a matter of hours to finish the excavation. And yes, we made incredible progress yesterday. We got two of the quadrants down, we've revealed some of the interior of the sarcophagus, but what we still need to do is incredibly important. We need to get down underneath that sarcophagus and see if we can identify any pristine soils that haven't been exposed since the Roman times. And what I'd like to do too is to really understand how the coffin works, how the, how the base works, how the lid works, how the clips that hold the two together work. And I've got to start off with the most nightmarish jigsaw puzzle without a picture to help me, putting all those stones back together to see if we can reconstruct the lid. It's an awful lot of work to do and the clock is ticking. Yes, don't, don't, don't count the hours, it's too scary. The sun is back out and it's the second and last day of our dig. Given their complex history, we have been stunned by the extraordinary state of preservation of the bones. So I decided to do some chemical analysis to see if we could better understand their story. Naomi. Hi. <laughs> That's good timing. It is good timing that I've just found a kneecap. Oh, wow. I was just about to ask if I could step in and analyse some bone. Is, of this course. A, is it a good time? It is a good time. <laughs> okay. We've got um, plenty of them now. Let's have a look. What I thought I'd do is see how much lead's in the bones, because we obviously know we've got a lead-lined coffin. Yeah. And I'm intrigued to see how much contamination we've got. I think it, that's probably helped protect these bones. Yeah, so we've, I, I've never seen a lead reading this high on human remains. It's over one and a half percent lead in the bones themselves. So that is, that is significant contamination. And I wonder if that, those kind of levels of lead will sort of inhibit bacterial growth and things like that, which may, may sort of, may have helped keep the bones in this good condition for so long. Hey, that's the bottom. You got the bottom, Pete? Yeah, got the bottom. 
Wow. That's, that's deep, isn't it? That's deeper than I thought it was. That is a so serious it's... sarcophagus, isn't it? So like, much yeah. deeper than the interior, isn't it? Yeah. Can, can you Rapid imagine production. the weight of that then? If, if that, that is shallow in the of base. Yeah. I mean, whoever put that in, they did not want it going anywhere, did they? Absolutely great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whew. Oh, well done, Pete. John, you were here when this stone coffin was originally discovered, weren't you? In, in 1963, was it? Yeah, 63, yeah. 59 years ago. Yeah. So cast your mind back. What can you remember about it? Did it, did it look like this? Yes, well, but they didn't dig as deep as this then. Mm -hmm. They sort of cleared the top off. We, we, we cleared the top off and took it away and threw it in the old quarry. What, the, the lid? The lid, yeah. We smashed the old lid up with, with an iron bar and it was thrown on a trailer and taken away. Why because, did you do that? Well, because it was so near the surface, the stone and that off it would have got in the machinery. Oh, the, so the you cleared and that it. cleared it, yeah. So what do you think is all this stone that we've found? I, I mean, I look behind you, it's nearly a whole lid. I don't really know. Oh. But the, it was nowhere near as thick as that, the lid. It was just about three and a half, four inches thick. Oh, this is mystery upon mystery. It is, it yes. is. Yes. Yeah. So when you found the original lid, was it still in place with the with the clips? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I only knocked the bottom corner off. Pete. Hey, how you doing, Dave? I'm all right. I think we might have to make some decisions soon. Mm. I think let, let's focus on on the box that we've got producing. Mm -hmm. um, what we have got from the cut you've excavated so far is that lovely image of it in plan, which yeah. will come from Adam's uh, drone imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and that's given us that spatial sort of layout of, of the cut associated with it. Whereas the box now is, is giving us this wonderful vertical stratigraphy. So we're getting that sequence mm -hmm. of events yeah, yeah. Uh, coming through. It's of uh, interest. I I've just been looking at the section Ivan's been digging out here, uh, and I'm increasingly under the impression that, that the cut is much wider on this side than we previously thought it was. It almost looks like it's in at an angle as well, and looking oh. at looking at the, the depth of this sarcophagus, that is a huge weight. That must There's I no way that's been imagine. lifted in yeah. like this, has it? No, It no, must no, have been no. pushed in down a slope. No, I, I mean, we're, we're talking about the transportation and, and manoeuvring of this would have been a serious logistical challenge. I mean, that is at least twice uh, the thickness of stone to sarcophagus in the to cavity. Well, we haven't got to the bottom of the inside yet, we'll see. But, uh, but yes, certainly it looks it based on uh, the previous excavation. So could we, could we 3D model this and get an estimation of weight based on the density of stone that's under there, do you think? Yeah, yeah. And talk to Matt yeah. and see what we can do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, I mean, that is the shame about not having the box on the other side, because then we would have a full photographic profile. Mm. But um, yeah, I think you're right. I think we just haven't got the time for it, okay. uh, actually. So we'll concentrate on this mm. side. We'll record that in plan. We've got the nice, we've got the line of the cut. We can follow that round at the end of the day with yeah. a nice drone shot, but use this to get our sample underneath, which yeah. is what we really need, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, we've been quite lucky here. We've got the tall markings on mm. the external face of the sarcophagus. Mm. We've got the brackets yeah. uh, carving through here. Um, so, you know, it has provided us quite some information. Using Matt's 3D model, we're able to calculate that the sarcophagus would have likely weighed around 3.8 tonnes. That's the same weight as your average pickup truck. As the dig continues, the sieving team are working hard, going through the spoil and looking for residual materials. Looks like you're starting to get some full long bones exposed there, Naomi. Yeah, we have, Derek. We've got uh, we've got a femur coming up here. We've got, it's not quite sure what this is here, but it's definitely more bone. Some more popping up here. And I, again, the preservation is still... It's amazing, isn't it's it? It's really good to say it's been in and out and messed about with. So now you're starting to get these full long bones exposed. Are you getting a sense of the stature of this individual? Well, probably smaller than me, which is saying something since I'm four foot nine and three quarters. I mean, it's, I know it's probably too early to talk about age of death, but could this be quite a young person? Um, I mean, the original sort of report said she was about 30 years old. Um, mm. and not until I've got everything out and I can have a proper look, I'll be able to see if that is a, around about a right age yeah. estimation. Did the Romans have any strong beliefs about what happened to the person's spirit or, or was death just the end? So for pagan Romans, you know, sort of Mediterranean tradition, 
has everything between two extremes of a spectrum. Could be this is absolutely the end, there is nothing after this. Or it could be a kind of complex sort of afterlife of the kind we know about from the Greco-Roman mythology about crossing the river Styx, paying your coin to the ferryman, living in bliss or, or in damnation. Depending on how good Depending or bad you've been. Depending on your life. I mean, the middle ground is probably the more common view. So we have on Roman tombstones of an earlier period, the invocation of the manes, that always, the tombstones often start, dis manibus, to the spirits of the dead. And the manes there, the dead in general, but they're also your forebears, your ancestors. You know, they're there and present. Mm -hmm. So at commemorative ceremonies, you'll make an offering to them. You know, you might put some food and drink by the coffin, even in the coffin, if there's a uh, means of doing that. Oh, one of these mad feeding tubes. Exactly, tubes. one of these feeding tubes that you see yes, going down yes. into the So you can coffin. pour things actually in. Yes, yeah. because it's important. It's important because it's the perpetuation of those emotional bonds. Though that affection persists beyond death, but also because it kind of keeps the dead in their place. It's quasi-sacrificial. So the manes remain the manes, and they remain at a distance, and you're now part of the living community and you don't want to be polluted by them. Yeah, gosh. So it's sort of, it's trying to have their cake and eat it in some ways. You know, this is a person, it's bereavement. These are dearly loved people, but they're also now, they're dead and they're a corpse mm. and they're becoming part of this wider group of yes. spirits. We're starting to get a much better impression of what was inside the grave. But Helen is trying to figure out what happened above it, giving her a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. What is this? What are we going to do with it? What does it mean? This lot of stones, nicely shaped, got a good top to them, are twice as thick as this lot. And then Claire, you spotted those ones, yes, didn't you? Yes, the tool marks here are very different to some of the very flat there, and those are much more like the edge of the coffin, the way that the stones work there. Yeah, they're like the sides, yes, aren't like they? Yes, like the sides. Whereas this is like the, 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 the beautifully tooled top. Mm -hmm. So we've got two different treatments. I mean, never mind, because we've got two yes. different treatments in the, in the coffin. And then John the farmer dropped an absolute <laughs> bombshell when he told us that in 1963, the lid, of course, which is the area they'd hit with the plough, it was a danger to, to his farming mm -hmm. machinery. So they removed the lid, broke it into pieces and took it down to, to the farm and buried it down there. So it's, it's, it, it, it's not here to be found. While the team carry on digging, Keith has been metal detecting around the sarcophagus and has found some interesting pieces of lead work. Yes, that, yeah, shall we, uh... oh yes, look at that. That is beautiful, Keith. Wow, that's got some real weight to it, it has, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got something very similar to this, actually. We found when we did the the box down the side of the sarcophagus. Oh, yeah, uh, it's got the same shape here, isn't it? Where it's yeah. been moulded around. The... Yeah, that looks to me as if these have been moulded around the bracket. In fact, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same width as the brackets. That's interesting. I, I'm starting to wonder. I mean, if these are on each one, and when we found this one there, it was still in situ against the hole at the bottom of the bracket carving the bottom, that would have held the bracket into the sarcophagus. Oh, yes, I see. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if these are functional, whether they're there to keep it in place, yeah. if they're decorative uh, to highlight the brackets themselves. But, um, then a great, great find, Keith. I mean, that's really, really nice to have two of them now. Looking at the excavation today, it's staggering how enormous that stone sarcophagus is. I mean, it's, it's twice as deep as it needs to be. Yeah. So that, imagine sort of in a, in a state of mourning, in a state of con contemplation with your family, the practicalities of having to get that thing into the ground. It's quite remarkable to imagine that process taking place in the past. Yes, because it's so difficult to, to lift and, and move. It's sort of, I, I imagine, sort of when, I, when I think of a funeral, I imagine a fairly serene process of <laughs> slowly lowering a coffin River into a ground. Yeah. yeah, but the reality of that would have been quite different to that, I think. It would have been quite a, a bustle to get that in the ground in one piece. Yeah, and also the business of commissioning it. Are these things yeah. off the shelf ready to go or do you have to have them made to measure? 
are, uh, do you have to wait for somebody to, to knock one up? How difficult are they to make? Where's the stone coming from? And I'm wondering here, because ours is so roughly hewn, and it's, it's that the, the extra depth of it even could be a sign that it was a bit of a rush job. It was done quickly for a, a person who went far before their time, an unexpected passing, if you will. We started to see charcoal almost mm. all the way around and then it got very clean. The backfill was incredibly clean after that. Right. So it could well be it was backfilled to the rim and then there was the cooking, feasting taking place nearby and some of that charcoal found its way into yes, the Yes, got trampled in. Yeah. Yes. When you get these back to your lab, what mm -hmm. sort of things are we going to be able to find out from it? Well, I'll firstly give them a nice clean so we can see the surface because obviously they're still the pre yes. well preserved but they're dirty mm -hmm. <laughs> um and then we get a chance to sort of see if there's any sort of pathologies mm -hmm. on there or so that's things like disease and evidence of disease and things like that yes yeah, so quite often in the sort of the hands and the feet we can see extra bony growth that could be arthritis right. okay yeah of course um but that's not always it's, it's not always the case because for bones to have these kind of markings on them, the person has had to sort of lived and suffered long enough for them to make their mark, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but I'm gonna start, I pretend that I don't know anything about them. Sure. Start with aging, sexing. Um, we might even be able to get um, a height estimation. We can take okay. some metric measurements. Okay, so I'm getting the other half of the pelvis out. So we've got a little bit missing here, but I think we've got them. You know, there was fragments coming out before, sure. so that will it'll all be, it'll, it will it'll fit complex. fit together. So that's so. the two bits you'll be able to put together. Well, put back together now. Is is it really the pelvis that's going to give us the best idea with regards to it's, the sex? It's one it? of the indicators, one of the main indicators. Once we put the pelvis together, you see there's like a an arc um, and it's much wider in females. So I've got the last piece now. Oh, well done. What, what's that bit? Uh, well this, so it's a weird looking bit. But here we've got, so this is your sacrum. Ah, so at the bottom. seat bone, is that the same thing? Well, well you know, you have your coccyx, you know if you've ever sat, fell awkwardly, that's right. really, really painful. Yeah. For, so this is the, this is the part ah, okay, that we've got. Right. So your, your pelvis comes either side of this. So, so then that's great. I mean, like, again, another really, really well preserved. Once you finish looking at the bones in the lab, then is, is the plan to bring them back and reinter them? Absolutely, 100%. And I think it would be nice since it's been a bit jumbled in here to lay, lay it back mm. out in anatomical position. Oh, yeah, that would yeah. be good. So you've done that before already. It feels just as rough underneath as it is on the side with a fairly irregular sort of corner edge here. So unlike its opposing end, it's got a lovely finish. As with the sides, where it can't be seen, the effort's not been necessarily placed into the craftsmanship. At last, we've got our soil sample from underneath the sarcophagus, ready to go off to the lab for examination. It's the end of day two and we have found out so much more about our burial. I'm particularly pleased that we've found bones in good condition so we're going to be able to confirm the age and the sex of the body in the grave. And I'm so pleased we can finally see the whole profile of the sarcophagus and I'm staggered at how deep it is. It's almost twice the depth of the interior. To have the opportunity to see the coffin in situ, to understand how the grave was made, the coffin placed in, the lid put on, that's so rare for these kinds of Roman burials. Usually they've been found and used as horse troughs in a farmyard. Mm. And working on the, on the lid, uh, discovering that there's so much extra stone, we were wondering if maybe some of it would, could even have been a, a marker so that you'd know exactly where to come back to. We even managed to see the, the amazing iron staples that held the lid on. And what's particularly lovely is we can leave some archaeology in situ for future archaeologists to investigate. Mm. And the rediscovery of this burial has meant quite an odyssey for its occupant. She's been from here to Oxford, back in a local farmhouse, put back again. We've examined her here and after uh, osteological examination, we'll be able to rebury her and hopefully placate the Marnes. They're happy that they've got their ancestor back with them here. 
Yeah, I think we should, uh, we should pour her a large glass of wine. I think that is going to keep her happy. Since filming, Naomi has continued to investigate the biography of Our Lady. She's discovered what appears to be a V-shaped cut mark and a hairline crack on one of the bones in her hands. These types of marks, often seen as a result of defensive injuries, could have been caused by an impact prior to her death. However, more detailed microscopic analysis is needed to be sure. She's also uncovered some important articles which could allude to what has happened to the skull following reinterment. If rediscovered, it could give us the opportunity to do some analysis and potentially see where she came from. Her story is far from over. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind-the-scenes insights.